Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Parker, and I'm the Director of Professional Education at Euphredi Manufacturing. Please take a moment to adjust your speaker volume to ensure that you will hear the presenter clearly and close any unnecessary open programs to have the highest quality video experience your system will allow. If you are joining us from a tablet or mobile device, it's possible that you may not be able to access some of the content in the seminar room. If this is the case, you will see a message on your screen that reads, content, content not supported. If you experience any technical issues related to the event itself, please enter your comments or questions in the tech support chat you will see on your screen, and our support team will assist you. Euphredia is pleased to sponsor this informative program on instrument care and maintenance. During the presentation, Lori Paschal will discuss issues that can arise with dental instruments and show how proper care and handling of your instruments can save your office time and money and reduce frustration. Recently named the top 25 women in dentistry for 2014 by Dental Products Report, Lori serves as the immediate past president for the American Dental Assistance Association. She is a regional account manager with Euphredi Manufacturing Company, where in addition to her sales responsibilities, she educates dental teams regarding instrumentation, infection prevention, and best practices in sterilization protocols. Lori's 30 years of experience as a dental assistant and her understanding of how to avoid the pitfalls of cleaning and sterilization procedures enabled her to identify instrument management challenges facing offices today. As you will hear, she is passionate about helping you learn how to preserve the life of your instrument. Now please join me in welcoming Lori Paschal. Thank you, Patty, um, and thank you to all of you for sharing the next hour with me. Um, what I hope to be able to do this evening is to provide you with some pearls uh, that are going to help you make your job easier when it comes to your instrumentation. So let's picture this. You've just seated your patient and you open up a pack of instruments and you notice that one of your instruments is broken. Or if you're an assistant, you pick up that instrument and you pass it off to the doctor and it's not performing properly. Or as a hygienist, you pick up that scaler and it just doesn't have those sharp edges on it that you need it to have. Or simply you look at those instruments and they just don't look right. Has this ever happened in your office? We're going to focus our discussion this evening on ways that we can apply a proactive approach to preventing damage to our dental instruments. We want to make sure that we're extending their life. We want to ensure proper functionality for our patient care and to be able to keep our practice moving efficiently and effectively. Let's look at a couple of objectives for this evening. Um, we're going to identify some common instrument problems and we're also going to talk about how we can possibly prevent these. I want you to be able to recognize when your instruments are in need of repair or replacement and what steps to take to preserve the life of your instruments. This is also going to include proper care and handling of your instruments, which you're going to find can save your office time, money, and frustration. We'll review how to conduct an instrument assessment within your office. We'll discuss the perils of retipping instrumentation and determine the benefits of recycling those old instruments. And I'll also be sharing with you some resources to help you preserve the life of the dental instruments that you're using in your practice. There are many benefits of proper maintenance of our instruments. Uh, productivity and efficiency, probably topping part of the list there. We want to make sure that we have the right instruments at our fingertips. We don't have, want to have to go searching for the right instrument or a properly functioning instrument. This is also going to mean having less time in setting up and tearing down our operatories. Of course, there's a cost savings associated with proper maintenance of our instruments. Proper care of our instruments is going to save money. We also want to make sure that we're investing in the right products. And this isn't limited to just the instruments. We also want to take into consideration the type of instrument care supplies that we're using as well. Safety, of course, is probably our number one issue. We want to make sure that we take care of our instruments, not only to keep the instrument safe, but to keep us safe as well. The OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard states that contaminated instruments need to be transported in a closed, puncture-resistant, leak-proof container. So the use of a cassette system is also going to help to minimize the risk of sharp injuries, saving us time, money, 
and of course stress because who doesn't want to be stressed our hand instruments are a fundamental to every practice and every procedure we can't do dentistry without these so the big question how do we know when our instruments need to be replaced and are you look, asking yourselves on a regular basis, what is it now that we do with the instruments that are no longer performing properly? Improper instrumentation function is going to potentially risk a failed procedure to us. We also are concerned with improper instrumentation that harm could possibly come to our patients. We could also bring harm to ourselves. And it also leads to inefficient productivity and workflow. These are all very important issues. We want to make sure that we're acting safely, that we're acting responsibly, and that we have the correct instrumentation and it's ready in any time that, that we need to have that instrument. Knowing the types of material um, that are used in our instruments is also going to help to identify any potential challenges that we have with our instruments. So let's take just a minute to look at some of the common materials that are used in the production of our dental instruments. Stainless steel is probably the most preferred for dental instruments because it's very easy to care for and it can be sterilized by most acceptable methods. So pretty much any type of sterilizer um, is going to, you're going to find that you're not going to have any issues with your stainless steel instruments. They're going to sterilize and clean very easily. Um, carbon steel instruments. Um, we have some pluses and minuses with this. Um, because it's hard, it's great for our cutting instruments. However, the challenge that we run into with sterilization is that carbon-based instruments very often can rust and corrode easily. Aluminum instruments are very popular for handles and composites, uh, for composite instruments. But again, too, a challenge here uh, that we have is that uh, due to the uh, surface finishes, chemicals and ultra ultrasonic cleaning equipment um, can very often damage these. And then finally, we're going to have instruments that are made from carbides. What's great about a carbide instrument is because it's hard, because it wears well. Um, these are excellent uh, when it comes to uh, things like scissors, knives, carvers. All of our cutting instruments tend to have carbide uh, sides on them. This is also great with needle holders because of the wear. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, needle holders with carbide inserts, they tend to last longer and they can be replaced. So uh, sometimes that can also lead to money savings in that we don't need to necessarily replace the instrument when we can just re uh, replace a portion of it. So what are some of the common problems that we see with our instruments? We're going to spend some time this evening talking about what some of these are as they're associated with instrument handling and care. Now the list that you're looking at here was developed based on issues that we see in our returns department uh, at Hugh Freedy and questions that we get asked from dental professionals like yourself. Again, these tend to be some of the most common problems. And if there's something that you're experiencing in your office and you don't see that on that list, make sure that you make a note of it. So if it's something that we can address later on, we'll be happy to do that for you. We want to make sure that we can well identify rust and corrosion. What you're going to find is that it's very unlikely that surgical grade stainless steel is going to rust. What appears sometimes as rust is actually a residual organic matter or possibly even a mineral deposit that tend to get into the crooks and the crannies, into the locks, into the serrations, into the hinges of our instruments, which have been baked onto the surface. If you look at the picture uh, that I just put up, the second instrument that looks kind of tarnished and yellow, um, you can kind of see in the grooves of that instrument there's some dark areas. Um, it's difficult to tell here, but you know the question tends to be when you're looking at an instrument like this, you know what is that? You know is that corrosion? Is that rust? Is that debris? Uh, either way, when you compare this instrument to the healthy shiny instrument on top of it. Um, which would you rather have in your mouth? You may know that it's clean, but it's kind of looking sad, and we want to make sure that, that we can kind of get these instruments to a place where they look a lot nicer, um, because trust me, your patients are going to be looking and they're going to be asking questions. Um, 
Things like your carbon-based instruments, particularly um, unplated carbon steel instruments or damage to the plating of carbon steel instruments, will also cause rust deposits on stainless steel instruments. We tend to see this a lot on uh, orthodontic instruments, on surgical instruments that are made from lesser quality metals. Also, uh, when you tend to see uh, things like rust on your stainless steel instruments, this could also be from rust spores that are in your sterilizers. Um, you want to make sure that you're cleaning your, your sterilizers according to your manufacturer's recommendations because rust spores that are contained within the sterilizer can also contaminate your instruments. Another way to think of rust and corrosion is much like we look at decay. If you think of a, a decayed tooth, uh, we know that that's contagious, and if that decay is not arrested, it's going to spread to the healthy teeth. Well, we can kind of look at rust and corrosion in much the same way. It's contagious. So if we have a contagious instrument that has some rust uh, or corrosion on it, it's going to potentially spread to our healthy instruments. Another area of concern when we're looking at causes of rust and corrosion is the lack of, of thorough rinsing of our instruments. If we don't thoroughly rinse our instruments when they come out of our um, ultrasonic baths, um, staining can often occur. And when this happens, that can often be confused or misinterpreted as corrosion. So let's look closely at a couple of the different problems that I know that you probably see in your offices or that you have seen in offices in the past. Corrosion seems to be one of the biggest challenges that are out there. So taking a look at these pictures, does any of this look familiar? Think about the, the instruments that are currently in your practice, um, and do you see any potential signs of corrosion? Things that you want to look for particularly are things like when we refer to corrosion, those rusty type uh, brownish areas, uh, particularly around the hinge areas in instruments. You're also going to notice this um, on the blades at the working ends. This is typically caused by either corrosive chemicals, it could be caused to insufficient rinsing and drying of your instruments. We want to make sure that instruments are being cleaned as soon as possible after they're used, and then we want to make sure that we thoroughly rinse them off. You wouldn't get out of the shower without rinsing off all of the soap and without getting all the shampoo out of your hair. And much the same way, if you don't rinse that, that soap off your body, it's going to leave a film. We have the same challenge with instruments if they're not rinsed off properly. Any instruments that continue to have detergent or moisture left on them while they're going through the sterilization process, this is another reason that they could possibly develop corrosion, spotting, um, discoloration. Additionally, we also want to make sure that all instruments are allowed to dry completely after cleaning and prior to sterilization, as this is also going to help to minimize any opportunity for corrosion or spotting to occur. Sometimes, however, um, corrosion is just on the surface of the metal of the instrument, and we can evaluate that very easily using a simple pencil eraser. Uh, when you see something that looks to be corrosive or something that looks like it could be rust on your instrument, just simply take a, a regular pencil eraser and just rub it on that spot. If that eraser removes that spot, you can pretty much be guaranteed that that was transferred from one instrument to another. This is another reason why you want to make sure that you can purchase instruments that are made of a high quality uh, medical stainless steel. Now realizing that sometimes uh, a practice uh, may choose to buy a lower quality instrument, um, sometimes things like explorers or dressing pliers or Toflemeyer bands, uh, this is something that happens very frequently in offices. The challenge with that is that when it's processed with other instruments um, is when we can tend to see the spread of corrosion from instrument to instrument. This corrosion typically starts on the lesser quality instrument and then it transfers to the others. Here's another example of what corrosion does uh, to instruments. Um, corrosion, if not treated, if we don't remove the corroded uh, instrument from our packs, one of the problems that we run into is that it can also lead to, uh, instrument, break, uh, to instrument breakage. And many times uh, breakage is due, uh, especially when we're looking at things like, uh, like our scissors in this particular instance, um, to the instrument simple, simply not being cleaned and sterilized properly. And also with hinged instruments, particularly with scissors, we see this a lot when they're sterilized in a closed position. 
All instruments should be cleaned with a non-corrosive, low-sudsing, pH-neutral detergent. Enzymatic cleaners actually uh, help to maximize cleaning for your dental instruments. What they do is, is they, they digest uh, blood proteins, tissue, other debris much faster than just your standard ordinary cleaners. Uh, they also help to prevent blood and debris from drying on the instruments and so we want to make sure that we keep these um, as, uh, as that we clean these as soon as possible. If it's not possible to get your instruments uh, into uh, sterilization, at least try to keep them moist. Uh, this can also help if you uh, take your air water syringe, if you've got instruments that may have blood or tissue debris on them, even just uh, spraying a little water on them while they're sitting will help those things from sticking. Or of course, you know, again, using something like an instrument bath just to set them in if you can't get to processing quick enough. It's also important to note that scissors and other hinged instruments should always be cleaned and sterilized in an open position. Studies have revealed that autoclaving or chemiclaving even um, expand the metal and that this is what can cause stress uh, when they're processed in a closed position. Uh, additionally, hardened debris, especially in the hinged areas, uh, insides of the blades, this will also cause stress. It'll cause the instruments to bind. This is when you kind of, you know, uh, use your scissors or any of your hinged instruments and they seem to be stiff. That's the binding that we're talking about. The stress can also cause microscopic cracks, which can actually lead to uh, the possibility of premature failure of our instrument. If you're not using a cassette system with clips to hold scissors in an open position, you want to make sure that when you're sterilizing them, when you're placing them in your sterilization pouches, that you open them as wide as possible and then place them within the pouch. Uh, you also want to make sure that with your hinged instruments that you lubricate these on a regular basis. You want to make sure that this is done after cleaning prior to sterilization. This is going to help to keep those uh, those joints open and patent and uh, the less likelihood that you're going to have of them sticking and, uh, and getting stuck in that closed position. Another more serious problem um, that we have with corrosion is that it can lead to pitting. This is again, it's a much more serious challenge. You can see by these instruments what looks like gouged out areas, uh, chipped away areas within the metal. This, again, this can be caused from corrosive chemicals, um, from not properly rinsing and drying our instruments. These are the types of things that compromise the functionality of the instrument. It also is going to leave it open uh, much more susceptible to corrosion. Uh, and the last thing that we want to do, uh, our instruments are an investment. We want to make sure that we're properly maintaining them. Um, when our instruments get into a situation such as this and we're compromising the functionality of the instrument, we're also compromising our patient care. These are some examples of baked on debris. Um, as I stated earlier, if you can't get your instruments into sterilization uh, through the proce proper process immediately, try to keep them moist, try to put them in a holding bath. Um, the examples that you're looking at here could have been caused by uh, insufficient cleaning, um, not using the correct amount of detergent, not making sure that it's dissolved properly. Um, things such as uh, uh, soap and uh, detergent that are left behind, material debris. Uh, these are the types of things that can cause discoloration on your instruments. If you're using a powdered product in your ultrasonic, you want to make sure that it is completely dissolved in the water before you uh, use, uh, put your instruments in here. Uh, it's these undissolved particles that can also uh, lead to some of the clogging and the sticking of your instruments in addition to this discoloration. Again, think of this as not getting the soap off of your body before you get out of the shower and you've got that residual uh, that's still on your skin. The other thing that I also want to point out is that it's very important that you read the directions for the cleaning products that you're using. If you use too little detergent or too much detergent, this can be an issue. And for this reason, it's also very important to know what the exact size of your ultrasonic is. Is it a one gallon? Is it a two and a half gallon? Is it a five gallon? Um, the reason that this is important is because you need to know how much detergent to put in the machine that's proper for that particular unit. You don't want to eyeball this. Um, many times I have been in offices where they're using a dilutable liquid. 
and they're just eyeballing it. They're just pouring in what looks like a sufficient amount for the unit that they're using. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using a measured cup. If it calls for one ounce, use one ounce. If it calls for three ounces, use three ounces. Also check your house brand products. Uh, a lot of uh, offices uh, tend to use a house brand enzymatic tablet. You get 64 tablets in the box, so it looks like a very good value for what you're getting. Nine times out of ten with almost all of these house brand products, if you read what the directions state, it's telling you you need to use two tablets per gallon. So that box of 64 tablets that may seem like a really good buy in actuality, um, you're only using half of what's necessary to clean your instruments. And we do need to clean our instruments properly before they can be sterilized. So uh, one of the things I'll challenge you to do when you go back to your practices tomorrow is to take a look at the products that you're using and see specifically how much it calls for. Pretty much everything is done on a gallon basis. So you're either going to use one ounce per gallon or one tablet or two tablets per gallon. So make sure that you're using the proper amount of detergents uh, within your ultrasonic cleaners. This is another wonderful um, problem that we tend to see often. This is what happens when your instruments are exposed to tartar and stain remover. Um, I urge you to make sure that you keep this far away from your instruments. Once your instruments are damaged uh, through chemical exposure, there's absolutely no coming back from this. This is totally and completely irreversible. It's very easy to mix up tartar and stain remover with an ultrasonic um, cleaner. So you want to make sure that you keep these far away. Even if um, you keep your tartar and stain remover far away from your instruments and you don't accidentally pour it into your ultrasonic thinking that it is your um, your ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of offices out there that will pour tartar and stain remover into a baggie and put dentures in that and then place that baggie within the ultrasonic. I caution you with this because if that baggie breaks, if there's a hole or a leak, guess what happens? Now that tartar and stain is gotten into our ultrasonic. So we might not have intentionally or inadvertently poured it in, but we are still getting leakage of that into our ultrasonic bath and therefore we're contaminating those instruments and we're going to have challenges like the photographs that you're looking at here. Uh, check with the manufacturer uh, for your ultrasonics if this is what you're using. A lot of them have special accessories um, that you can, uh, can utilize for doing this. Uh, beakers, uh, special holders that will help to avoid that problem. This is another example of, of common problems that we see with our instrumentation. Um, simply improper sharpening. The challenge that we have when we have instruments that are not sharpened properly is obviously we're not going to get the performance that we need to have out of them. Um, it's not going to be a comfortable situation for the patient. It's not going to be a comfortable situation for the clinician as well because now we're going to have to work harder in order to get that instrument to perform the way that we would like to see it. So let's take a look at each one of these pictures. If you take a, a look at the picture on the far left, this is going to show an example of what a new properly sharpened instrument, uh, sharpened scaler should look like. And you can see that there's one flat edge and it's sharp, um, and there's no light reflection coming off of that. Let's compare that now to the one that's in the middle. Uh, notice the light that's reflecting off of the dull areas. And then if you look at the instrument on the far right, uh, there's multiple flats and angles on the working end of this instrument. Things like improper angles and dull edges, this is what makes each stroke less effective and it's going to lead to burnished calculus deposits and again it's going to be very uncomfortable for, for the clinician as well as the, uh, as well as the patient. Um, the other thing that we also need to caution about is that improperly sharpened instruments can also become weakened and that's going to lead to a higher potential possibly for breakage of that instrument. We also need to consider the life expectancy of instruments. All instruments do have a life expectancy and they should be replaced when that life expectancy is reached. Um, if you look at the pictures on the screen, you'll notice that two are marked return 
and two are marked original. This is to give you an idea of what the original instrument looked like next to the instruments that were actually returned for repair or replacement. And with this, um, with this challenge that we have, uh, some of the things that you want to make sure that you are avoiding is that when an instrument is overly sharpened, this also is going to give us more of a challenge for having things uh, break easily. You can see that the first instrument that's marked returned uh, is very thin, is something that was overly sharpened. Now if you look at the instrument to the far right, uh, same situation and you can see where it actually snapped. Things that you also want to take into consideration or remember is that it is normal for instruments to wear over a period of time, especially if they're instruments that we use repeatedly. Um, again, the challenge that we have when we're using instruments that are used well beyond their life expectancy is that that can lead to breakage. Uh, if any of you have had any challenges with instruments breaking, you know, it could be that they were just worn and they were toward the end of their life cycle. So it's really important that you check your instruments regularly uh, for wear and replace them uh, when they need to be replaced. Everybody likes a nice new shiny instrument and uh, it's one of the things that I always want to make sure that I point out when we're looking at new instruments is that you want to remember that these are not sterile. Uh, they are not sterile right out of the pack so please make sure that prior to use that you're cleaning and sterilizing them. It's also prefer excuse me, it's also preferable however that we are when you are processing new instruments that you do so initially by themselves so you don't want to process these with any additional uh, instrumentation. The reason for this is that there is a, a, a corrosion resistance on stainless steel and what this does is it primarily depends upon the quality of, a, uh, of what we refer to as a passive layer. And without getting too technical, when we talk about a passive layer, this is basically a layer of chromium oxide that results from a chemical reaction between the chromium that's in the steel alloy and the oxygen that's in the air. New instruments tend to have a much thinner passive layer, but this does build over time, so don't worry about that. But brand new instruments um, can be more susceptible to corrosion when they're right out of the package. So we want to make sure that we give them the opportunity to be able to kind of build that layer up. So that's why we recommend sterilize them on their own first and then go ahead and let them meet the other instruments. So all of that being said, how do I know when it's time to replace my instruments? It's very important to remember, as stated, that all instruments do have a useful life expectancy and unfortunately it's typically not that of the practice or the practitioner. Uh, instruments do need to be replaced uh, when they reach this life expectancy. And again, by not replacing your instruments, we're increasing the risk of breakage and also uh, the potential of injury uh, to our patients and even to ourselves. Before we can look at determining the age of an instrument, let's just take a quick review of the different parts of an instrument. We have our working end, we have a shank, come on, and we have our handle. It's important to know these parts because when, when instruments um, need to be replaced, uh, sometimes you'll be asked where the problem with the instrument lies. So along that as well, we also want to make sure that um, when we're using specifically a double-ended instrument, uh, that it's important to be able to identify which blade is on which end. Um, and you're going to find, depending on the instrumentation, it can be written two different ways. It can be written along the handle or it can be written across the handle. So for instance, in this example, uh, the Gracie 1-2, if I needed to know what side was the 1 and one side was the 2, it's very simple. Because when you're reading it along the handle, the 1 is going to go to the left and the 1 is going to go and the 2 is going to go to the right. If we're looking across the handle, it's equally as, as simple to read. The 1 is going to be to the top and the 2 is going to be to the bottom. Now this is also true not only for uh, scalers but for restorative instruments, uh, such as carvers, burnishers, etc. So for instance, if you're using a discoid cleoid 4-5, um, the 4 would be to the left, the 5 would be to the right, the 4 would be to the top, 
the 5 would be to the bottom. So very simple to be able to tell which is which. Now, as previously stated, all instruments do have a life expectancy. So my question to you is, do you know how old the instruments are that you're using? I will guarantee you will be extremely surprised when you go back and you look tomorrow to see uh, the instruments that you have. And we'll now have a little bit better sense of how to be able to tell what the age of that instrument is. But how do we know what the life expectancy is? The, uh, this life expectancy of instruments by category was developed by Dr. Tom Kilgore, Assistant Dean of Clinical Affairs at Boston University. Now, this is not a be-all, end-all. This is just a great little tool to give you a thumbnail, a ballpark idea as to what the average life expectancy of dental instruments are. Now, this is going to vary from practice to practice, and a lot of it is going to depend on the type of practice that you're in. It's also going to depend on the use of that instrument. In practices that have a high volume, you're going to go through instrumentation a lot faster than in offices that may not be as large. Uh, you'll tend to see uh, clinics, um, uh, VAs, hospitals, uh, military bases, where they tend to see a large amount of patients. They're going to go through their instrumentation on a much faster basis. So for instance, in this example, uh, when it talks about uh, Everedge scalers having a life expectancy of 12 to 18 months, if you're in a high volume practice or if you're in a large clinic, this could be maybe um, 6 to 12 months. So use this with a grain of salt and consider too when you're looking at this what type of practice you're in. Again, you know, if, if you're in an ortho practice, your ortho instruments are going to wear faster than they would in a practice where maybe, you know, we're just bending a wire or clipping something uh, uh, if need be. Uh, same thing with uh, oral surgery instruments that are going to be used more in oral surgery practice versus in a general practice. So again, this is a great little tool just to kind of give you an idea, but know that you're not necessarily going to be held to this. So how do I know how old my instruments really are? Um, because dental instruments are medical devices controlled by the FDA, all dental manufacturers are required to mark the date the instrument was manufactured on their instruments. Different manufacturers will have their own system. Uh, this chart here is uh, how Hugh Freedy uh, determines the age of our instruments. Now, prior to 2010, we used an alphanumeric system. This had a letter signifying the month and a number representing the year that the instrument was made. So if you look at this chart, um, in the 1990s, letters A through M, um, and then in the 2000s, letters N through Z. So if the instrument was manufactured in the 1990s, it will have a letter uh, along with a number to associate the month and the year. Uh, in the 2000s, we used the second half of the alphabet. And note that uh, a zero, a, uh, the letter I and the letter O are not used uh, because they're too much like a 1 and a 0 and gets confusing there. Um, then in uh, 2010, we had to come up with something different. So here's where we actually um, started coding with a total of four numbers, two for the month and two for the year. Uh, it's also much easier to read because it actually looks like a real date code. So if we look at the instrument that's in this picture, and you can see where the arrow is pointing out N9, that's telling me that this instrument was manufactured in January of 2009. Does that make sense? This is another way to read a date code. Um, this is using uh, just the numeric system. So on this particular instrument, uh, 0314, March of 2014. And a couple of other examples here just to give you an idea, 0811, 1110, very easy to tell starting in 2014 the age of the instrument. Now again, this is Hugh Freedy's system. Other uh, companies have other ways to be able to tell the age of their instruments. But if you are using any Hugh Freedy instruments, this will be a good way to go back tomorrow and be able to tell or get an idea of how old the instruments are that you're currently utilizing. When do you know when your instruments are ready for retirement? And are we recycling? Are we retipping instruments? Let's take a poll and see who is retipping. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to give you just another minute if you haven't pulled in yet. And we'll count it down. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, so let's take a look here. 72% um, of the people who polled said that they never retip. 23% uh, say that they retip occasionally. And just about 4.5% say that they retip all the time. Why is this important? We're going to go ahead and move on. When we talk about retipping, um, this is when a tip is forcibly removed and a new one is forcibly replaced. And there are a lot of offices uh, that do prefer to send instruments out to be retipped rather to, than uh, to be professionally sharpened or recycle or replace them. So as I said, this is where we're going to forcibly remove a tip. Oops and we're going to replace it more often than not with an end of lesser quality. Now that there are, there are a lot of misconceptions that revolve around this process and it's important to note that retipping is not the replacement of the tip of the instrument with a sharp blade as it's commonly believed to be. Um, as I said, retipping is a forcible removal of an instrument tip from the handle. When you look at the original manufacturing process, the working ends of all scalers and curettes are designed with a distinct feature, which serves as a mechanical lock. And I'm going to back up here for just a second so that you can see a picture of this. Um, you can kind of see that little dimpled uh, area at the end there. Um, this is what we call what serves as, as what we just refer to as a mechanical lock uh, when placed into the handle. Additionally, uh, at Hugh Freedy, we do add a glue to ensure that a chemical bond um, is there as well as uh, the mechanical bond. Now, during this retipping process, this end is heated up, and this is forcibly removed, and then another tip, as we stated, of unknown quality is put in in its place. When we look at how this, this process works, um, when we, we have a challenge with, with the accessible force uh, exerting on here, we're going to do multiple damage uh, to that handpiece, or excuse me, to, uh, to the uh, handle of that instrument. Um, the big challenge, too, is that in a lot of instances, um, the handle is actually damaged um, during this process. And, this happens because, again, these working ends are press fit together. Uh, the diameter of the working end is actually larger than the diameter of the, andles, of the uh, handle's point of insertion. Um, and it's also important to note that none of the major instrument manuf manufacturers recommend or participate in the retipping of instrumentation because of the risks that are associated with this process. And so we're going to take a look at some of the, uh, the challenges that come along with retipping of instruments. So you see this nice big crack here in the side? Um, this is actually showing the damage to the handle by this retipping process. Uh, this shows why uh, it is so important not uh, to retip an instrument. If you take a look at that crack, what are po some of the possible consequences uh, of using an instrument with something like this? Um, we're not going to be able to properly clean it, are we? And think about that going into your nasty, dirty ultrasonic uh, with all of the other debris and things that are floating around in there. So not only are we having possible patient debris in there, bacteria, whatever else is swimming around in our ultrasonic is getting in there as well, and we can't possibly clean that out. I've also heard tales of um, liquid oozing uh, from these cracks uh, in some of these instruments that have been retipped. Makes you want to run right out there and retip now, doesn't it? 
Here are some other challenges. Uh, a lot of times when these instruments come back, these are not going to be balanced instruments because they weren't manufactured to the original specifications. You're going to see this a lot uh, with inaccurate um, shank or blade angles. And you also note, too, uh, very bulky blades. Um, some of the things that you're also going to find with these variations is, you know, some maybe some subtle ergonomic challenges. Uh, it may be more difficult to perform the same um, to perform the same procedure uh, that you were before. You might have to uh, you, you could have to exert yourself. You may have to work harder. You may find also too that these tips are not lasting as long as your original um, instrumentation was. The other thing that I also want you to consider is the handle of the instrument itself is probably has the least amount of technology associated with it than the rest of the instrumentation. So why would we want to salvage that? Why would we want to sacrifice uh, and salvage just that handle um, and then discard you know, the precision of what the original blade and shank designs were when they were originally manufactured? Here's an example of a retipped instrument. Look at where those red arrows are. You can see where the handle is warped. It kind of also it looks a little fat or pudgy there uh, in, that, uh, in that resin end. Additionally, the cone and the grip were destroyed. If you look at the, uh, at the left side of your screen, that's what it looked like originally. It no longer looks like that. And of course, a uh, tip of lesser quality was inserted into the end. Let's take a look at another example. Um, can any of you tell me, especially you hygienists out there, what's wrong with this picture? This was an instrument that I had, uh, that was actually, I had picked up in an office. We were looking to uh, get some new instruments. And they brought out instruments to me and they said, you know, we want to go ahead and um, uh, replace some of the instruments that we have. This is the instrument, one of the instruments that we really like. And instinctively, without looking at the ends, I just looked at the name of the instrument, H6H7. Well, then I took a, I took a further look at the end of the instrument. Now, if you look at how that instrument is labeled, it's labeled H6H7, but it's actually a Nebraska 135. So this is an example of how you have, um, of what happens with a retipped instrument. Uh, this is a situation where, be careful what you ask for. They wanted a thick-handled instrument. Well, they got a thick-handled instrument. They got the ends that they wanted but that does not tell the story of what the instrument actually is. So if somebody didn't know what that instrument was, they're going to pick it up thinking that's an H6H7. Additionally, if we roll this instrument over, uh, we're going to, we would notice that it was not marked retipped. And the reason that that is important is because dental instruments are medical devices, as we stated, which are regulated by the FDA. Therefore, the retippers re are required to label scalers, uh, as shown in this image, uh, that they've been altered. So again, if you're retipping instruments, take a look at some of the instruments that you've gotten back recently and see if they are, in fact, marked retipped. So if this hasn't already convinced you that retipping is not a good idea, let's consider some additional risks. Uh, retipped instruments are no longer the responsibility or liability of the original manufacturer. Once it's altered, the retipper is now responsible for the, scale, for the scaler's performance and liability. This is true for all manufacturers and not just Hugh Freedy. It also avoids any instrument warranty. Tips have been reported to fail intraorally as well as during instrument processing. It's also important to know that the clinician treating the patient is the one that's ultimately liable should an injury occur with a retipped instrument. So given the lower quality of, of the points that are being put in here, the inherent risks, and the minimal savings is really not that much um, when you're looking at purchasing remanufactured instruments. But if you're still considering this or if your doctor insists, um, take this challenge, place one of your retipped instruments into a pack of new instruments, and make sure that you band them to keep them together so that you know, you know that these are all this group together and use them on a variety of patients. Checking them regularly for wear. I will almost guarantee that you're going to find that your retipped instruments are going to wear much faster than the newer ones from the original uh, manufacturer. So what do we do with all of those old instruments? Um, the best thing to do is to, um, is to recycle. Uh, all instrument uh, companies offer recycling programs. Hugh Freedy's is called Environdent. 
programs allow you to send in old broken instruments and receive new ones in exchange. Uh, recycled instruments, you don't have to worry. These are not being turned back into new instruments. Uh, but they are actually uh, used in things like construction for rebar. Uh, they're used in buildings. So they'll have a nice new life, but they won't have a nice new life as another dental instrument. So let's get, pro let's get a little bit proactive here. Um, what can we do to check the instruments that are in our practice? Um, this is something that you should probably consider doing, conducting an instrument assessment um, in an annual basis. So this way you can kind of predict, uh, predict uh, what you're going to need uh, in the way of instrumentation and be able to budget for that. So how do we conduct uh, an instrument assessment? Um, the first thing that you want to do is gather up um, your instruments by procedural setup. Uh, this is typically the best approach to do this because we're keeping instruments like instruments together. And this way we're not getting rid of a lot of instruments at the same time. We can go ahead and do this by group. Things that you want to be able to check for are things such as um, corrosion and pitting, uh, rust and discoloration, uh, excessive buildup of debris, bent and broken working ends, scratch damage surfaces. These are all things that can occur during cleaning and handling. When we're just looking at regular wear and tear, this is where we're looking at dull edges and loose hinge joints. And even though we mentioned bent and broken working ends and scratched and damaged surfaces under cleaning and handling, these can also occur just during our normal instrument wear and tear. Um, you, we want to identify and code these uh, in some way for replacing. Maybe they're using a band. Maybe they're, we're taking them out and putting them to a box. And then you want to make a list of items that need to be uh, reordered, repaired, recycled. And make sure that, uh, that instruments that are damaged are taken out so that they don't further damage any of the other instrumentation. And anything that we're not going to be using anymore, we can certainly go ahead and send to recycle. So when we're looking at preserving the life of our instrumentation, let's wrap this up by discussing some of the steps um, that we should be considered uh, when we're, we're looking at preservation. Um, we know that most damage to instruments as sharps injuries tend to occur during the instrument processing, you know, the cleaning and care. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, first and foremost that we're handling them carefully uh, during the sterilization process. We want to make sure that we're not overloading baskets, that uh, we're keeping instruments separate that don't need to be, in, uh, that don't need to be uh, sterilized together. Um, in addition to that, um, know that 80% of sharps injuries do happen to occur during the instrument processing. And in case you didn't know, um, obviously dental assistants, since they're responsible for the majority of cleaning and care of instrumentation, they're the ones that, are, that have the highest number of sharps injuries at about 75%, followed by hygienists at 18%, and doctors at 7%. We want to make sure that we're thoroughly cleaning our instruments, make sure that we're using a good ultrasonic solution, and make sure that our ultrasonic machine is working properly. Make sure that that is a pH, a pH neutral solution, that you're using a dual enzymatic, something that's going to break down both blood and protein. Uh, a chelating agent, that's a big fancy word for um, jet dry. Basically, a chelating agent, um, as another measure of protection to your instruments. Uh, it helps uh, guard against things like uh, dullness, um, spotting, uh, binding of hinges. Uh, it kind of keeps hard water minerals from settling on the instruments. Um, and um, we also want to make sure that we use uh, something like rust removers. Here's an example of using a rust remover. The instrument on the top um, these, believe it or not, these are both the same instruments. Uh, we have a before and after. So the top instrument uh, shows so obvious signs of rust, and below it is the exact same instrument after it's been treated. The product that Hugh Freedy uses is called Shine Renew. Other uh, companies have other products uh, that do treat uh, stain and rust as well. Here's another example. If you're using uh, stainless steel cassettes, where you can actually uh, renew the life of those cassettes. So here's an older cassette. You can see that it's stained, uh, might have some corrosion on it. Uh, the silicone rails are looking kind of sad. But this is the exact same cassette after it was uh, cleaned very well with a uh, rust remover and the silicone rails were replaced. It's also to remember 
to rinse and dry your instruments thoroughly prior to sterilization. This is going to help to avoid um, the um, spotting and potential for corrosion that occurs when instruments sit wet. Um, hinged instruments should be sterilized in an open position. Make sure that you're lubricating them on a regular basis. If the hinge begins to feel uh, sticky or it feels like you can't open it, uh, you want to make sure that you use some sort of penetrating oil on this. Um, and um, if you're using a cassette system, this is probably the greatest way that you can protect your instruments. Um, in the addition to um, to actually um, keeping things organized and increasing the efficiency and the productivity and the safety within your office. This is also protecting your instruments during cleaning and sterilization. Your instruments are, a, um, are an investment and you want to make sure that you protect that investment and the best way to do that is using a cassette system. Uh, make sure that you're sharpening your instruments regularly. Don't wait until they get dull uh, to where you actually have to put a new edge on them. It's a lot easier to do maintenance sharpening than it is to actually rehone an instrument. And make sure that you're limiting um, your instruments to the recommended use. In other words, don't use uh, tissue scissors for cutting uh, into your um, gingival retraction cord. Uh, make sure you're just using them for, for tissue. Um, if you're using a periostal elevator, let's make sure that we're severing the PDL with it and that we're actually not elevating with it. Making sure that we're using the right needle holders um, for the suture that we're selected. These are all items that are going to help us to maintain and preserve the life of our instruments. Now before we begin um, the question and answer, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Patty for just a minute because I know that she has some additional information to give you. As Lori is queuing up the questions, feel, feel free to continue to put your questions in the Q&A pod on the left side of your screen. As we approach the end of the program in just a few moments, we'll provide you with access to the post-test link and additional educational resources on this topic, as well as information on instrument site recycling. You'll easily just simply highlight the URL link in the web's pod area click the browse to button and you can open up a new window for your post test and for any of these other resources. You will have the option to email, print, or save your CE certificate upon successful completion of the post test. Now due to um, expected high volume of test takers right after the program, you may experience a delay in downloading your CE. Uh, if you do, we ask for your patience, allow the system to respond and catch up with you, and be sure to check the bottom of your screen for the download pop-up. Now we'll go ahead and turn it back over to Lori to begin the Q&A session. Thank you, Patty. Okay, let's see what we have here. Um, from Christine, I have some instruments that I accidentally used tartar and stain remover on. Can they still be used even though they have chemical damage from tartar and stain? Um, it really depends on the instrument and what you're using it for. To be perfectly honest, um, at this point, they're probably damaged beyond uh, use and beyond repair. Uh, they More than likely, uh, the edges have been destroyed, and you're probably not going to get any kind of useful work out of them. I would, I would suggest putting those into your recycle uh, box to send those for recycling. Uh, let's see. From Elizabeth, uh, do you have to put new instruments in the ultrasonic uh, to clean them or just sterilize them? Uh, personally, I say just go ahead and put them in the ultrasonic. Again, we want to be able to we need to clean before we can sterilize. We know that new instruments do have uh, have a bit of a smear layer, so to speak, on them, and so we want to make sure that we clean them properly before we sterilize. Um, from Catherine, why is a lesser quality working end used with retipping? When instruments are uh, coming from the manufacturer. All of the metal is the same, and it is uh, designed to be able to, um, to withstand the rigors of being worked together. Any time that you have metals are, that are dissimilar, that's when we start to have problems with things like corrosion and rust. So typically, the type of metal that's used uh, from the manufacturer is not going to be the same what the retipper is using. I can give you an example with, uh, with Hugh Freedy's EverEdge. Our EverEdge uh, metal is uh, honed, it's produced, it's a special composite of metal 
that is done in such a way that it is going to last longer. You're not going to be able to duplicate that outside of Hugh Freedy. So now we're putting a lesser quality tip into that instrument. And again, we always run the risk of dissimilar metals, you know, causing rust and corrosion because they just don't match up. Um, from Michelle, why bother retipping re instruments at all? Well, that's kind of our sediments as well. When you look at what the average cost to retip instruments are versus purchasing new instruments, um, really when you start doing the math, it's really not such a bargain after all. It might look like a pretty good deal because maybe you're only paying six to eight dollars per instrument. Well, then you do the math and go times how many instruments, times how many times a year. A lot of offices will do this quarterly. Um, when you start looking at that, you are not really having a significant amount of savings. When you look at purchasing new instruments, uh, you're assured of the safety, you're assured of the quality, you're assured of a warranty that comes along with that instrument. Uh, you, you can take all of the risk out of that. As far as the pricing goes, and you know, being a dental assistant for a very long time and having the responsibility of having to look at budgets and this is what I have to spend, I can buy whatever supplies I need as long as I stay within this budget, I'm very sensitive to that. However, uh, you know, check with your, with your dental dealers. Uh, there's always promotions that are available, and more often times than not, uh, along with those promotions, uh, when you start doing the math, um, the, uh, it's, it is almost uh, the same, if not less, than to retip your instruments. Uh, let's see. From, where did it go? Well, I hope you all are seeing that. I'm just trying to slide down here so I can see some of these questions. Um, uh, from Marie and from Nancy, these are, are very similar questions. You know, how often should you lubricate your hinged instruments, and what do you recommend for lubricating? Um, there are uh, uh, products on the market that are specifically designed for um, instrument lubrication. They're specifically designed for lubricating those joints. Uh, Hugh Freedy has our own. Uh, other instrument companies, I'm sure, have them as well. You want to make sure that you're lubricating your instruments prior to sterilization. Now, you'll also find, too, that, again, uh, uh, surgical offices, uh, offices that, uh, ortho offices, that are using a lot of high uh, uh, hinged instruments will tend to probably need to, um, to lubricate on a more regular basis. Um, from Brittany, does Hugh Freedy accept instruments from other manufacturers for the EnviroDent program? Absolutely. We'll take anybody's instruments. Uh, we'll take our instruments. We'll take any manufacturer. We'll take any house brand. They can be broken. It doesn't matter. We'll take all of those in for, um, the, uh, for recycling. Um, from, uh, from Lainey, why is it important to dry before sterilization? Um, several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, if uh, we uh, bag or wrap our instruments wet, um, sterilizers don't have the capacity to draw out the additional moisture um, besides what it's pumping in. So when, we have, when instruments go in wet, they're going to come out wet. And when they come out wet and they stay wet in those packages, that's what leads to spots, which eventually can lead to rust and corrosion. So it's very, uh, it's very important that you make sure that they're dry. Um, from Leanne, our dentist asks us to manually scrub instruments before going into the ultrasonic. Um, I don't recommend this at all. You're going to find times that you may have something on a... Um, on an instrument, uh, that should be the exception rather than the rule. You should be using a long-handled brush and uh, utility gloves when you're doing this. The whole reason that you're using an ultrasonic is so that you can avoid manual scrubbing. Uh, products such as Enzymac Gel um, and other uh, companies that, that have um, cleaners that can be sprayed on, kind of like scrubbing bubbles prior to uh, the going into the ultrasonic will help to start break down that, that, that blood and debris and keep that from sticking so you shouldn't have to hand scrub. Um, we're at 9 o'clock and I know that there are some, uh, there are several other questions that I'm not able to get to right now but I want to be respectful so that uh, those of you that do need to jump off can do that so that you can go ahead and take your um, 
your test, but I'll be happy to stay on for a couple of minutes to continue answering some of these questions. Um, I would like to tell you that it has been an absolute pleasure um, uh, to be with all of you this evening. I really want to thank you all for the absolute um, gift of your time for this hour and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any other specific questions or that I can help you in any way. We'd like to thank Lori for an excellent program and we'd also like to thank all of you for your very active participation and great questions this evening. We hope you identified some concepts that will be useful in your practice and help you to perform at your best. If you believe any of your colleagues would benefit from this information presented, a recorded version of the webinar will be available at eufridi.com front slash webinars sometime tomorrow afternoon. Thank you all again for joining us, and we look forward to connecting with you on a future webinar. And Lori, we thank you again. If you take a few more minutes to answer some of the remaining questions, that would be terrific. I'll be happy to do so because there actually are some, some other really good questions that are coming on here, coming up here. So um, one of them from Susan uh, asking if there are any dryers that are available to dry cassettes quickly. There are instrument dryers. They look a lot like your instrument washers, um, but they're specifically for drying instruments. Uh, they do dry them very quickly this way, which is great. I do want to caution you, however, to not use um, a, a um, a dryer, um, like a fan, there we go, I'll spit it out here in a second. Um, don't use a fan to dry your instruments. Again, when we're, these instruments have come out of the ultrasonic, they're clean, but they're still contaminated. So, uh, so again, we don't want to actually spread any aerosols into, uh, into the um, sterilization area and then eventually into the practice. So we want to make sure that um, you're using an actual instrument, instrument dryer and not a fan. Um, uh, let's see, uh, from, uh, from Santa, is it true that dirty instruments should be run in ultrasonic first, then scrubbed with a metal bristled brush? No. Uh, again, the whole reason that we're using an ultrasonic cleaner is to clean the instruments prior to sterilization. Again, hand scrubbing should be the exception, not the rule. And typically, uh, if you have debris that doesn't come off um, in ultrasonic is when you would do that with a long bristled brush um, and make sure that you're wearing um, uh, night, the heavy uh, utility gloves to do so. Uh, from Amber, uh, what are your thoughts on cold sterilants? Um, my thoughts on cold sterilants is that they're costly, they're caustic, and they're unverifiable. Um, pretty much just about any instrument that is currently out on the market now is either uh, can be heat sterilized or it uh, is a disposable. So that is what I would tend to look at. If you have something that does specify that it does need to be uh, uh, put in a cold sterilant, you know, I would check to see what the situation with that is. Um, uh, from Alyssa, is it okay to sharpen Everedge? Absolutely. All Everedge means is that it's going to stay sharper 50% longer. You still want to maintain that and you still want to do uh, regular any recommendations on the best stone to use for sharpening scalers from Catherine? Um, it really just depends on what you're most comfortable with. I tend to tell people that uh, whatever type of stone that you're going to use that you're going to feel comfortable with and use is the right stone to use. You just want to make sure that you are utilizing it properly. Things like India stones and Arkansas stones require oil. Uh, things like uh, the new uh, diamond uh, sharpening cards and um, Ceramic stones don't require any type of lubrication. So it's, uh, you also want to use something uh, that's more coarse if we are honing and putting an edge back on versus something that's a little bit finer if all we're doing is. What would you recommend uh, buying to safely clean retainers and dentures in the ultrasonic? Um, if you're going to be utilizing your ultrasonic for cleaning these, um, I would certainly check with the manufacturer to see what kind of uh, accessories are available for you to be able to do that safely. The other thing to consider is possibly just a small, maybe a one gallon um, ultrasonic that is specifically used only for um, cleaning these items. Uh, and I'm going to take one more and uh, let's see, from, from Diana, should, uh, should you cycle 15 minutes in the uh, ultrasonic prior to sterilization? Uh, generally, the rule of thumb is that if your instruments are not in a cassette, usually 5 to 10 minutes in the ultrasonic. If your instruments are in a cassette, 15 to 20 minutes. 
Uh, thank you all so much for all of your wonderful questions. Um, if there was anything that you really have a burning uh, desire to get an answer to, uh, my, uh, my email address is up, and please uh, be more than happy uh, to answer your questions individually. Thank you again, and it was a pleasure, and I look forward to uh, seeing and speaking with you again.